I remember going to see the Lord of the Rings trilogy with my father and my brother. It was life-changing not only because seeing Legolas and Liv Tyler on the big screen shot me into puberty, but also because we bonded over Frodo's epic, lonely journey. My dad and I would talk about the deeper meaning behind the films and read the books together, and it really kicked off my lifelong love of film and my personal journey into the larger world. So let's talk about daddies. I will Daddy is a word that's loaded with symbolism and emotional baggage. If we take daddy to mean the male source of parental authority, then sure, some people have a biological father that fulfills that role. But that supreme authority can also be coded as female. Father! Or a foster parent. He may have been your father, boy, but he wasn't your daddy. Or a mentor. That's the force. Really? Wow, it must be really strong well, of you. I've never thought any Ow! And each of these daddies represents one ideology or another. Some movies even have multiple daddies competing for the obedience of the main character. Darth Vader is both a symbolic daddy and a literal daddy, but the Emperor is a daddy without being a daddy. There's lots of different types of daddy stories. There are movies like Taken and Death Wish, where the plot revolves around a murder daddy. There are movies like Last Jedi, Gardens of the Galaxy 2, and Harry Potter that asks, who is my daddy? Then there are movies where the daddy's murder becomes the primary motivation for the main character, like Rogue One or Captain America's Civil War, in which not only are Tony Stark's daddy and mommy murder to motivate him, but also this unmemorable bad guy's daddy, wife, and child were all murdered. Then there are movies where the daddy's death isn't necessarily the motivating factor, but serves as the inciting incident which kicks off the story. Like Thor Ragnarok, where Odin announces, kind of just like out of the blue, that he's over it, he's dying or whatever. And there's Spider-Man in both Captain America Civil War and Spider-Man Homecoming. Peter's parents were murdered by Red Skull's henchmen, at least in one version of the backstory. Then Uncle Ben, who becomes his surrogate daddy number one, is murdered by a random criminal. And then Tony Stark comes along and becomes surrogate daddy number two, who not so subtly tries to bang Peter's coincidentally hot Aunt May. And even though Spider-Man and Tony Stark are distinct characters, the way it's written, it invites a single male audience member to identify with both of those men simultaneously. Like Peter full on sees what Tony is doing, but instead of being creeped out, he's enamored with the celebrity arms dealer Tony Stark. So we as an audience can feel comfortable about objectifying Aunt May. If that wasn't some weird edible shit, I don't know what is. And I keep using the gender term daddy over and over, not to erase female characters, but to highlight that in mainstream patriarchal movies and culture, studios will also try to disguise a traditional male dominated story as progressive by simply putting a female face on it. Certainly she can't be fighting on the side of entrenched sexism and patriarchy because she's a female. Talk lies to me, mommy. Each one of the examples that I gave earlier tells us that parental authority, usually derived from the male biological parent, is super important. Not parental love, but parental authority. Sometimes they call it love, but no, Thanos does not love Gamora. Like it's almost comical how unloving some of these dads are, and how it's just dismissed or ignored. There's a scene in Captain America Civil War which is pretty much only there to establish that Tony Stark's parents were distant, unloving a-holes. But when he finds out Bucky killed them, despite being fully aware that the Winter Soldier was brainwashed, Tony goes cuckoo bananas and can't control himself because of his comic book universe love for his parents and flies into a punchy rage. Which is exactly the same thing Star-Lord does after he finds out that Daddy Thanos killed the woman that he loves. In both these examples, the death of the loved one is treated as something so emotionally terrible, it causes the surviving loved one to go, I can't control myself! And then, just when the plot calls for it, derail the good guy's plans. And I get it, I get it. Finding out that news in such a terrible way would be devastating. But repeating this exact same plot point makes it feel suspiciously like studios rely on a paint by number structure. And the reason it feels like it's paint by numbers is because it kind of is. The superhero part of it, the powers that a person has, like you, that's an important part of being a superhero, but we identify with the humanity. We identify with the fact that they have the same struggles that we have. You know, they have a mother and a father. Um, so it's the backstory. It's, it's, it's who are they? Like, why does he respect his father so much? 
These familiar relationships are narrative shorthand to build backstory. A way to inject a few minutes of personal drama into movies that are otherwise just two and a half hours of well-orchestrated punching. And using shorthand is not necessarily a bad thing. Tropes like this can be used to great effect. But what we need to be aware of is how and why filmmakers use certain tropes. It's up to us to sit through the details, to look for answers to bigger questions like... What does it say about American society that mainstream films spend so much time humanizing abusive dads? I've written, dear daddy, we miss you. And wish you were with us to love. Let's imagine a father takes his daughter to Infinity War. First, from the father's perspective, Thanos is deeply flawed, but ultimately Thanos is able to justify his actions, at least to himself. He carries himself like a wise god rather than a raging demon. He may do bad things to people, but Josh Brolin is a pretty likable actor with a commanding voice. And Thanos has to sacrifice the one person that he loves, his daughter, in order to achieve what he thinks is a noble goal. Killing Gamora hurts him so bad, but he just has to do it! And he definitely loves her. The universe confirms that fact by rewarding him for killing her. This hypothetical father sitting in the theater next to his hypothetical daughter is being told that he may not always act like it, but he loves his daughter and wants what's best for everyone, even when he acts unreasonably. For that father sitting in the audience, it's ultimately an ego-reinforcing story. Now let's imagine from the daughter's point of view. Imagine that this hypothetical girl sitting in a the theater has been abused by her father. For an abused child, which Gamora definitely is, this narrative is utterly hopeless. How many young children will watch this movie sitting in a theater right next to an authority figure who abuses them? The message that that child will receive is, abuse is love. Now, one might argue that the reason Gamora has become so strong and capable is because of the abuse she suffered from Thanos, as if her virtues are a gift given to her as a result of her dad's abuse. This absolutely strips Gamora of agency or autonomy and glamorizes abuse. She's not strong because of the abuse. She is strong in spite of that abuse. Her strength is what helped her survive that abuse. Her strength is her own. Her cunning is her own. She doesn't owe it to Thanos. And the flip side of the coin is the idea that anyone who didn't survive Thanos must be weak. But no, being lined up and shot as a civilian does not make you weak. It makes Thanos a big bad daddy. I've written this letter to daddy saying I love you. Man of Steel is a truly bonkers movie. It's a story of a godlike boy and the three adult men striving to be his daddy. These men lecture the boy about what he should do and constantly talk down to him. The most prominent of these daddies is Pa Kent, the morally vacant pseudo folksy father figure who, when you actually stop to think about his words, talks nonsense. He contradicts himself repeatedly, or just speaks in non sequiturs, quickly dismissing any points that Clark brings up without actually addressing any of them head on. Clark asks the very straightforward question, should I have let a bus full of children die? And Pa Kent's response? Maybe. Maybe? This is the lesson from Superman, that sometimes letting a bus full of children drown is the right choice. Like, this is a movie that straight up argues that dead school children is something that we should be okay with. Clark may have superhuman strength, but Pa Kent has a superhuman ability to negate the value of human life. But you're not just anyone, Clark, and I have to believe that you were... that you were sent here for a reason. Yes, Clark, you were sent here to murder a school bus full of children through inaction. What a fun purpose in life. You're gonna have to make a choice choice of whether to stand proud in front of the human race or not. Clark already made that choice by saving a bus full of children. And what was your reaction to his choice, Daddy? To neg him. Within the narrative, Pa Kent's prediction that you can't help somebody without hurting other people does come true. So by the internal logic of the narrative, the movie is telling us that Pa Kent is right. Everything in this scene, and many others, paint Pa Kent as a wise man dispensing wisdom from the music to the melodramatic acting. He is someone that the movie is constructing in a way that tells us, listen to this guy, he knows what he's talking about. We talked about this, you have 
Oh, Clark, you have to keep this side of yourself a secret. Just look at the way Pa Kent is framed, always higher than Clark. Pa Kent never bends down or kneels to get on the same level as Clark. He never tries to connect with his son never answers a single question with a straight answer, and yet the movie seems totally unaware of how bad a father Pa Kent is. Jor-El is another daddy who lectures Clark about choice. Your mother and I believe Krypton had lost something precious. The element of choice, of chance. What if a child dreamed of becoming something other than what society had intended for him or her? Then immediately tells him what to do. You can embody the best of both worlds. The dream your mother and I dedicated our lives to preserve. The people of Earth are different from us, it's true. But ultimately, I believe that's a good thing. They won't necessarily make the same mistakes we did. Not if you guide them, Cal. Uh, yeah, I'm Russell Crowe. I'm here to tell you that you can make your own choices, Cal. Now put on this suit with my family's logo on it and do literally everything I tell you. Within the story, Jor-El is not even physically there. He's a simulation. He's a projected image who lectures at Clark. Just like when you go watch this movie in a theater, Pa Kent is a projected image who lectures at us. You ever get the feeling that Zack Snyder desperately wants to be all of our daddies? And teach us confusing lessons about whether or not kids should die? There's no way he would want us to unflinchingly follow the advice of all these daddies as if we're following the will of God. <laughs> of course Snyder would never be involved in a PR campaign whose goal was to get Christian evangelical preachers to give sermons about how Superman is exactly like Jesus. We may want to soar like Superman, but most of the time we feel quite earthbound. A movie like Man of Steel provides a thrilling picture of what sacrifice, duty, courage, and honor look like. It is a rousing story. Thankfully, a genuine superhero, Jesus Christ, intervened on our behalf. Oh my god. And then there is the classic Save Martha beat from Batman vs Superman. A lot of people have made fun of this moment, but let's take a look at it critically and figure out exactly how it functions and why it's so fucking weird. The moment that Clark says, save Martha, is a moment when Superman and Batman are suddenly able to empathize with each other. You could read this as a white male cyborg billionaire and a white male godlike alien realizing that we're all just people, that we have so much in common. But it's not a moment of identification with each other. Instead, it's a recognition of mutual devotion to an abstract parental unit. It's his mother's name! Mutual devotion to authority. It's his mother's name. Oh, my mommy. Oh, your mommy. Oh, all of our mommies. It's so reductive to the range of emotions we have towards our parents. We don't actually know anything about Bruce's mother from this movie. Whether she was loving, unloving, abusive, or supportive, or some combination of all of those. Like, you know, a real human being. <laughs> oh, but of course she's perfect. Because mommies are just perfect. I mean, I know every time I meet someone whose mom has the same name as my mom, we become best friends, like, immediately. In fact, I've started using Save Martha as a casual greeting instead of hello and goodbye. Save Martha. Save Martha. Save Martha, baby. Say that after dates. Maybe you're thinking, none of this daddy stuff really matters. It's all just parent-child relationships. It doesn't say anything about society. There is one thing, though, that if it were true, might suggest that we have a problem. But what I'm about to mention is so out there. We, as a society, would never collectively do this thing. It would be totally, unbelievably absurd if we all got together and started referring to the creator of the universe as Father. We would just never do that because that'd be like a straight up admission that we place a ridiculous amount of symbolic authority in daddies. It would mean that thousands of years ago, some daddy was like, hey, call me and God the same thing because I'm a very reasonable person and I want you to obey me as you obey God. Oh boy, sometimes my imagination just like gets away from me. <laughs> and I'm also definitely glad that here in the United States, we've never had a president who had such deep-seated daddy issues that he may have fabricated an assassination attempt on his own father as an excuse to go to war. There's no doubt his hatred is mainly directed at us. There's no doubt he can't stand us. After all, this is the guy that tried to kill my dad at one time. 
Oh boy. And I am glad that there is not an emotionally stunted group of people who conflate our president with their own father. And of course, we all view incest as a bad thing, right? So a bunch of Christians would never elect a president who openly wants to plow his own daughter. Sometimes they'll say, you know, he can't be that bad a guy. Look at Ivanka. <laughs> she wanted to make the trip. She said, Dad, can I go with you? She actually said, Daddy, can I go with you? I like that, right? Daddy, can I go with you? I said, yes, you can. <laughs> Just, all those things are real. Are there mainstream Hollywood sci-fi or action movies that don't conflate love with abuse? Is there an alternative to the daddy worship and authority worship that we see in all of these movies? And how will I tie this back to the Lord of the Rings? Leave me your daddy comments below. Follow me on Twitter and YouTube. Plus, if you enjoyed this video, you can support me on Patreon to help me make more. And as always, save Martha. I've written a letter.